about is love. Run, come, run, come. What you know? Yeah. What me say? Uh. This love not the real love. To God in our heart, we don't suffering love. Everywhere, oh, where we go. God, I give it. I'm just a give it. Yeah. Oh, we love it.
tell you about his love. Run, come, run, come. What you know? Yeah. What me say? Uh. This love are the real love. To God in our heart, we do suffering love. Everywhere, oh, where we go. God, I give it. Him just I give it. Yeah. Oh, we love it.
one more time, everybody say. Good e microphone, please. Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Those of you who have seats, may I ask you to please take them now. And uh, we will resume the mixing and mingling after the formal part of this evening's proceedings. We are awaiting the arrival of the Prime Minister. However, she's stuck in traffic, but she needs to leave to get to another engagement, so we have permission to get started. So those of you who can, please stand for the playing of the National Anthem of Barbados. Thank you very much. You may be seated. The right excellent Sir Garfield Sobers, Sir Wesley Hall, Sir Charles Griffith, Sir Richard Cheltenham, Sir Philip Graves, Sir Henry Fraser. I don't know if there have been that many knights gathered in one place outside the court of King Arthur. Perhaps we need to get a round table. Mr. Paul Ackeroyd, members of the Hall family, members of the media, other distinguished guests. Good evening, I'm Sharon Marshall, and it is my honor and a pleasure to serve as MC for this evening's proceedings. Welcome to the Mecca, and thank you for being here for the launch of the book, Answering the Call, The Extraordinary Life of Sir Wesley Hall. We begin the evening's program with a word of prayer from Bishop Lionel Clark. Bishop Clark. Good evening, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my friend and brother, the Reverend Dr. Sir Wesley Hall has asked me to say a word of prayer of blessing a prayer of thanksgiving for his ability to finish this project and be able to present it to the rest of us and to the world. I looked at it briefly last night and I saw in it something that indicated to me that the answering to the call was really the one call that affected him, selected from the Holy Scriptures. And I thought I'd just bring along my Bible. Uh, Patrick Gollop thought I was going to preach. I'm not going to preach. 
I just brought along my Bible because I want to quote just that text that transformed the great Wes Hall into the minister of the gospel that he is today. I'm reading from Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. But whatsoever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing knowledge, the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That was the text that brought Wes Hall to the altar of confession and salvation and has transformed him from the greatest, one of the greatest cricketers to one of the greatest preachers. Shall we bow our heads? Our loving Heavenly Father, everlasting God, God of the universe, we give you thanks, we give you praise because the honor and glory are due to you for blessing this man of the soil who has been able, O oh Lord, to accomplish such great heights in the world and who now adds to the literary uh, <coughs> values of the world. He is now going to be launched, O oh Lord, in uh, something that will cause him to be remembered down through the years by many generations. We thank you because you took him through this period of the COVID during which it was so difficult to get things done. But Lord, you help him to finish this job. We thank you, Heavenly Father, because you have never, you've never left him alone. Down through the years, we have seen your hand in his life. Even when he did not turn to you, you were holding him up. And we thank you, Lord, for the minister that you've now made him to be, and to all those to whom his message goes. We see him, O oh Lord, as Saul on the Damascus Road, having heard from you and having been changed and uh, having answered the call, a higher calling. We ask, O oh Heavenly Father, that as this book and all its contents goes forth to the, to the island, to the Caribbean, even to the whole world, that there will be those who will recognize that because of the the magic you have worked in his life because of the changes brought about by the Holy Spirit in his life, that they will recognize that the similar things can happen in their lives and that they will be able, O oh Lord, to call upon you and accept you as a Lord of their lives, recognizing that after all is done, after all is said, after all is accomplished, then we have to come to face to face with you and answer for the works done in our body. This is not, O oh Lord, the kind of thought that many people want to deal with, but we recognize, O oh Lord, that we cannot uh, resist it, we cannot uh, refuse it, we cannot evade it, because this will be an, uh, an appointment which we all have to keep. We thank you, Lord, for the talent with which you have blessed Wes Hall. We thank you, Lord, because you have chosen men and women from small countries like this, and you have endowed them with such skills, such abilities, such talents, O oh Lord, that their names can be on the lips of people all over the globe. We ask you, Heavenly Father, that you will receive the honor and the praise out of his life, out of our lives, and all those whom his life touches. Grant, Heavenly Father, that this high calling of God in Christ Jesus may be such that it will affect all those who come under his influence. We give you now, Lord, the events of this evening. We ask that you will let your blessings be upon us, 
Let your presence be here and grant that your name to receive the honor, the glory, and the praise, and the fellowship among us will be rich and rewarding. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And we ask that you will let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. All the people say, Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop Clark. There is another knight who regrets not being able to be here, Sir Hilary Beckles, and he has sent a recorded message, a video message. However, due to time constraints, we won't be able to play it this evening, but it will be included in the recording of this evening's program. We move on now to remarks from someone who knows Sir Wes well. I invite his daughter, Dr. Carrie Hall, to share some reflections. Dr. Hall? Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you, Honorable Prime Minister, esteemed knights, friends and family who are here today. I would like to thank all of you for coming out to celebrate this most momentous and auspicious occasion. We're celebrating my father's new book and autobiography, Answering the Call, and I'm so happy to be here today, Daddy, to be able to do that with you. Now, it seemed like it was just yesterday that I was standing at a podium like this one, in a red dress similar to this one, regaling my father on what was then his, what I assume was his the crowning moment of his life was the erection of a statue in his honor when he was immortalized in bronze. Little did I know that he was not quite done with us yet, that he still has some gas in the tank. And that in your eighth decade, I'm so proud that you're able to be here with us to witness the erection of your statue and for you to have we call to the finest detail those elements of your life that you could now leave a legacy for us and for this generation and generations next to come. Thank you so much, Father, for that. Now, the thing about this book, Answering the Call, it could not be more appropriately named because even though I arrived in my father's life just after he had conquered the cricketing world, I was around for all the action that was yet to come. And there was a lot of action. It was a serious ride, Father. Thank you so much for giving us a wonderful life. And I've only known my father to be of service to mankind my entire life, always given selflessly to everyone, anyone that needed assistance. And the tables that we have at our house that are laden with awards from all over the world a testament to the gratitude that everyone has for you, Father, for, as I said, the legacy that you would have left for us and an example to be emulated and benchmarked by us all. Now, there's one thing about this book. I know when the book was written, at first I was a little nervous because I was saying, how are they going to get all the elements, the breadth and the depth and the diversity of my father's full life into a singular document. But I must say, Paul, you nailed it. You stuck the landing. From the time that I picked up this book, I thought, All right, I'll start reading it and do it 20 pages over the next week, knock it off day by day. But from the minute I picked it up, I was riveted. I was sold. I could not put it down. This book was a page turner and a tear jerker for me. It took me on a journey of my father's life. What I love about it, we see his amazing life through his eyes, through his emotions, his thoughts. He takes us through his triumphs, the trials, tribulations, and the triumphs and the victories of his life, the hills and valleys. There's one thing about this book. I thought I knew my father because we were really close. I inherited the, the loquacious gene from him, so we talk a lot talk over each other. It's usually very painful watching this in a conversation. Right, Daddy? Yeah. And um, 
even though we've talked over the years and I've heard all of the different stories from my dad, when I read that book, I saw things about my father and learned things that I never knew. And I saw my father through new lenses. It's like if I was meeting him for the first time. And it was a wondrous, joyous, and very emotional experience for me. One of the things I love is I can never understand how could one individual choose so many different paths in life and excel in each of them. And that's exactly what he did. Whatever path you chose, Daddy, you excelled in. And that is the hallmark of a brilliant, very special and unique individual. Now, this book really is a comprehensive and inspirational treatise of a life of service, a life of excellence, a life of servant leadership, and a life of phenomenal achievement. You may think that because it's a book on Wes Hall, that it's a cricket book, but it's not a cricket book. It's more than a cricket book. Daddy, this book is about, not only is it an inspirational book, it is about overcoming adversity, overcoming poverty. It's about courage. It's about grit and determination. It's about commitment and dedication. It's about perseverance and resilience. It is about daring to dream, but not only to dream, daring to dream big and to relentlessly pursue these dreams and to fulfill them. It's about taking the lemons that you're throwing at you in life and making one big fat juicy pitcher of lemonade with it. Bajan lemonade. <laughs> it's also about not letting your station in life at your birth dictate your station in life for the rest of your life. Father, this book will be enjoyed by all, no matter what age, what gender, what ethnicity, what social strata you're from. This book is an inspiration for us to reach for the stars. And I'm not saying this because he's my daddy. I all know I'm an unapologetic daddy's girl. Everybody knows that. I'm saying this because it's the truth, and you'll see it shortly when you read the book for yourselves. So, I know I should pull up here, but I just want to quickly tell you there was one part of the book that stood out for me, because many parts did. But as, as his daughter, when I read the part of that day he showed up at cricket and the bowler did not come to the game, and for some crazy reason, my father actually thought he was a batsman at some stage of his life, and a wicket keeper. But I don't know where he got that from, but I'm sure you were a really good daddy. I'm sure of that. But he, when that person handed him the ball, that set the wheels of destiny in motion, his destiny, the rest of his life. And he took that ball, and I think he bowled out everybody that day. So they saw the talent, and very quickly he was enrolled into the West Indies team. But because he had raw talent, he was just raw talent. He was just quick. He was like a diamond in the rough. So his first tour was disastrous. I don't think he got any wickets if, or many. And he came back pretty much in disgrace and humiliation. I think he told me the other night that somebody said, if it took 100 more years, Bess Hall would never learn how to bowl properly. And it was a pretty rough period for him. And I'm sure as a daughter reading that, I, my heart went out to him. Because I said, I'm sure how heartbroken he was how sad, how humiliated he probably was as well. And um, I, I just felt like if I could reach back in time and hold him on his shoulder and say, don't worry, soldier, you got this. But I didn't need to, because he found the inner strength to come back. He could have given up then, and we would never have known Wes Hall as the great, one of the greatest cricketers that ever lived. He could have given up, he didn't. He dug in deep and found that fist gear, and he pushed back, and he overcame his challenges. And he got back his self-confidence and he taught himself how to bowl. You know, he ran 10 miles a day, he built up his muscles, his stamina, and he came back. After a year in cricket and exile, he, he returned. And he returned in a blaze of glory. I think he told me in that first tour, he, he took 30 wickets. A short year later, he was, he got the first hat trick, first West Indian to get a hat trick. Two short years later, he was the architect of that final over of the tightest 
one of the greatest sporting moments in history. People are still buzzing about that 60 years later. And Father, there will be no Titus without you, that last over. It was a comedy of errors, let's face it. But you did good, Father, you did good. It would not have been a Titus without you. And five years to the day of the failure and coming back home beaten and broken, he was voted Winston's Cricketer of the Year, and he was the fastest and most lethal and best bowler in the world, five short years later. And that is testimony to the man. And Daddy, when I was reading it, and my heart was breaking, and I followed your story, when you got that Winston Cricketer, I let go three big Tiger Woods fifth pumps, man. Yes, 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 Father. I said, that's the whole spirit. And those are the different emotions I got throughout the book. So I just wanted to share some moments with you. So thank you so much. I'm going to pull up here. Thank you so much. Daddy, thank you for living. Thank you for having us. My brothers and I, my brothers and you back. Thank you for leaving there, for teaching us how to achieve what is considered to be the impossible. And thank you for giving of yourself to this world. The world will know you are here. And that's the way all of us should live our life. Thank you for being a model for the rest of us to emulate. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for indulging me. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Hall. I think you kept within the allotted time. <laughs> we want to acknowledge the presence of Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Moore Motley. I've learned that in the course of writing this book, Paul Ackroyd made four trips to Barbados from his home in Surrey to visit Sir Wes and his family. It's estimated that he spent more than 100 hours with the subject of this biography. Mr. Ackroyd has been persuaded to make some brief remarks, and I invite him now to do so. Thank you. Is there a tougher gig than following Kerry Hall? <laughs> I, I suspect not. Prime Minister, knights, ladies and gentlemen, as a lifelong cricket fan and lover of West Indian cricket, I was delighted to accept when John Mackenzie invited me to write a short appreciation of Wes Hall. However, just a couple of minutes into my first phone conversation with Sir Wes, it was obvious that short appreciation was not an option. Here was a man who has lived such a rich and varied life and who, in his ninth decade, was still brimming with thoughts and ideas that I could have filled a book twice the size of answering the call. That was four years ago. Subsequently, over the course of several trips to Barbados, four, I recorded in excess of 100 hours of conversation with Sir Wes. Therefore, lack of material was never likely to be an issue. On the contrary, the challenge became how to condense material I had without diminishing any of Wes's achievements on the cricket field and beyond. Wes and I worked on this together over many long WhatsApp discussions. For the record, the longest of these lasted two hours 41 minutes. I think you can probably guess who did most of the talking. <laughs> of course, we had our first share of disagreements, but neither of us ever lost sight of our shared goal of doing justice to a remarkable story. Hopefully, we've come close. I'd like to conclude by offering some richly deserved words of thanks. First of all, to the publisher, John Mackenzie. Without his vision, quite simply, this book would never have happened. To Cora Cumberbatch, for the countless hours she spent with Sir Wes, reading through reams of manuscript and typing out his thoughts and accounts of events which she then forwarded to me. As the go-between for two stubborn old men, her patience was astonishing. <laughs> to Stephen Chalk, a renowned cricket author and former publisher in England who's responsible for the book's superb design and layout. To my wife Rachel and son Tom, who have been hugely supportive throughout, not least in the run-up to this event. 
equally supportive and welcoming has been Wes's family. And I would like to pay special thanks to Sean, Kerry and Remy. My biggest debt of gratitude though is of course to Sir Wes himself. He put his trust in me from the outset and Navit never gave less than 100% commitment to this project. I witnessed at first hand the energy and enthusiasm which have brought him so much success. He is truly a force of nature and I am greatly honoured to be able to call him my friend. It's been a heck of a journey, Wes, and I thank you with all my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ackroyd. Now it's the turn of the man whose life and legacy are celebrated in the book to make some remarks. Note I didn't say brief remarks. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Sir Wesley Winfield Hall. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I just wish to say a few words because I know from my racing days that a good nine for long horse can run and win at five for longs. But a five for long horse can never win a mile and a half. So tonight, I give up. I, I'm okay with the time. <laughs> I just want to say that the, the, the courage of my life has been drifted in many districts. And as a consequence, I have spoken in many fora. This celebration has, you know, it really has boggled my mind. And I really am torn between two examples. The Prime Minister of England, the Honourable John Major, gave an account on his the church, the greatest man in the church, that is, the one who is in the boss. And um, he was he came to Barbados and he was preaching at the St. Michael's Cathedral. And he said, Oh, it's really a great thing for me to come to the island that gave birth to the three W's, World, Weeks, and Walcott. And there was a great, you know, audience reception. Then he said, well, look, I think I will preach on the three W's. And again, there was this great reception. And then he said, he looked at them eyeball to eyeball and said, I speak to you on work, worship, and living. Yes. Uh, and witness. Now, there was a, I wouldn't say it was a great, uh, I wouldn't say there was a great, uh, from the people, what happened is that it was a deafening silence. Yeah. So I really don't really, wish to make you believe that I would offer you such ambiguity. I wouldn't do that. So I am going to, you know, I'm going really to do something a lot easier. And it's the, the Apostle Peter. Yes, when he was on the mount and he saw Elijah then he saw Moses, and indeed the glory of Jesus. He said, Master, it is good to be here. Tonight, I'm asking every one of you to believe that tonight, really, it is very good to be here. 
Prime Minister, I just wish to thank you for coming. The last time I saw you, it was at, you know, two years ago. I don't know, I think that's terrible. But anyhow, you know, and I, I thank you then, and I do a trifecta using a racing term. I thank you for that day. I thank you for all that you've done. And now I thank you for gracing us with your visit here today. Now, I just wish to say to you that I do not have to worry about, you know, what happens tonight because I'll say this, that I don't really have to put what's my purpose tonight. So shall I say, what pearls of wisdom, what shaft of wit, what golden epigrams must I produce tonight so that you will say that he was okay? <laughs> I, really, I, I want you to say that the last four times I tried to go in the pulpit, believe you me, it was when Ross's daughter died and then John Boyce told Kerry, why well, you don't go up there and hold your father before he drop dead? <laughs> but Tony, but Tony Koja, I couldn't believe it. He called me the day before he died and said, look, I want you to, to preach tomorrow. I said, I could do that. He said, but I want you to do the whole thing. I said, I can't do that. I can hardly stand up, man. He said, well, listen, tell me, I say you can do it, and I'm dying. So if you don't want to do it, just a minute. I decided I would do it. Boy, when I got halfway standing up and, you know, having to move around and call the others to come and to pray and things like that. You know, Maxine, my cousin, she came and helped me out. I know you, you wonder who, who Maxine is. I know you know that. But Maxine is my cousin, and neither she nor I knew that more than three years ago. But we are happy with it. You know, I always thought that Maxine was of this family. There's no doubt about that. Yes, now this book is, in my opinion, one of the best books that I have read. <laughs> Look, don't play the fool, because from the day I went to Comba Mayor, I was a library assistant. The reason for that was that I would send, I would read five books instead of one, five. And I think that my mother realized that, and although she didn't go to high school, she, you know, read them too. So she was able, in my youth, when I did things wrong. I just wish to say to you that, you know, going to Combermere and going to St. Giles, you know, there were two great schools. And um, I was very happy to be there. Because, you know, when I was only five years, six years old, I used to say, I'm going to come a man. Nobody noticed me. So when I got to eight, I said that I would stop being loquacious, as Kerry said, and I would never be cesspedalian. I didn't want to do that at all, play big words and things like that. And I just wish to say to all of you that I went to Combermere because I desired to do so from the time I was five years. I thought that if I went to Combermere and then I played for the West Indies, that by 30 I would be a millionaire. Well, that's the worst thought anyone could think in their life. Because the West Indies board paid us five pounds a week in England. So that meant that if 
someone invited you to, lunch, to dinner or lunch, you, you can reciprocate. So therefore, you're not going to do that. And we lost a lot in that situation. But we had to come a mayor, and I saw Robert Branca at the beginning of the gate there, dressed up, you know, always very well dressed. And um, I thought he was an old boy because he, you boys, their pants don't be, you know, very well cut and things like that. You always wear something bigger to grow into, you know, if you're poor. But I met these guys and I decided that this is the place to be. All right, we're going to the first farm. And that morning, the new minister, the new, not minister, he was a minister, he, he was a teacher. And he came in and he said to the boys, boys, I would like you to stand when the, the master comes in, number one. Number two, I would like you to tell me your names. And number three, I would like you to tell me which school you go to. So I went around the road, you know, and he half for boys, that sort of thing. And when he got to me, I said, Wesley Hall? And he said, stop. So I said, yes, sir. He said, what did I tell you to do? I said, well, you told me to call my name. I said, and? I said, well, I called my name and you stopped me. So he said, go on again. And when he got to, when he got to me, I said, Wesley Hall again. He said, go to the headmaster. I said, okay, Simmons is here. And I believe he set it up. <laughs> really. The headmaster is an Englishman, six foot six or so. You know, and when, he, when I came in, he said, what are you doing here? I said, excuse me? Said, what are you doing here? I said, teacher said, I mean, we don't have teachers here. I said, what do you have then? He said, <laughs> he said they're all masters. So, the mere fact that I had gone you know, having been sent by a teacher, this tall, big Englishman dropped six lashes in my back. You know, I was so, so, I tell you, I was so sore, you know, I couldn't even move. He got me out, get out now. So I down, went down, the boys were there waiting. I didn't speak to anybody, I'm vexed now, you know. And then it came now to the lunchtime. I decided that I would, you know, go down the car. They'd all gone off, and I was behind. When I got to the middle of the, the corridor, this one said, what are you doing here? Get off the corridor. And he said, don't you know you don't walk on the corridors that come from here? I said, you don't have any signs. <laughs> so, he said, so, so you're, school, you, you're, you're big, but you're, you're, you're you're, you're a new boy. I didn't say anything, but he saw, you know, your parents should never do this. He gave your child a haircut that the back is bare. He knew I was there. He slapped me one big hit, knocked me on the ground. And when I was on the ground, I said, you know, I think I, I, think I can leave this school. And I got up one right hook and burst my fingers. Yeah, but burst, burst it at my fingers. But the thing I want to tell you, from that day, the fellows followed me like the Pied Piper of Hamlet. Yes. So I had a pretty great time at Carmere because nobody interfered with me. And uh, Rob Branca said, well, boy, where's I with you? So I don't think anybody's going to trouble you. But Carmere was a great school, and um, so was St. Giles. And tonight we are going to give um, someone from Carmere and someone from St. Giles, a book for their library. And I think that is something that I really wanted to do for many years. <laughs> this book is called, you know, it's caused me to have some, some problems because I did not know what to call it. The first one was Pace Like Fire. That was all right. But Paul is such a great guy that he's very patient. And he was able to, you know, when I said, well, I don't like that, he would come back and do it, maybe the same thing, but another way. 
And you find out that when that happened, that was good. So ladies and gentlemen, I sincerely hope that this book will sell well. I'll tell you why. When I first saw it, I was rather, not annoyed, but I was, you know, concerned that we in the West Indies don't seem to be able to get things like books from England like that. But I must say to you that Paul and, um, you know, Mr. McKenzie, they were very considerate, and I think that we have now solved that problem, and any amount of books that they want in Barbados, I think that that is what happened. Now, I know Kerry is going to punch me in my back, tell me move on, but that's all right. Nobody didn't tell you so. <laughs> yeah. So, that's a bouncer, man. <laughs> I just wish to say to, to all of you that I am very proud of Paul and his wife because I'm sure that she is a wonderful lady. But when we were talking for two hours on the, uh, on the, on the phone, then she didn't say very much about us, you know. So I'd just like to thank her. As a matter of fact, she has sold 10 books herself on the, on the way, and I think that might be better than some uh, people who pretend to sell books. Now, I just wish to say to you that having a book um, done is quite a beautiful thing. But this time, during the pandemic, it was terrible. Sometimes Paul would be trying to get out of England, he can't. You know, sometimes people would not wear masks on the, on the bus, on the, on, the, on, on, on the plane, and things like that. Here in Barbados, I consider that we did quite well in the circumstances, but he had to be coming in that time, all that time. And therefore, I thank him so much for persisting, persisting. And therefore, I am very happy about that. Now, what are the things that we wrote about, that he wrote about, and that I looked at? I looked at the fact that playing for the West Indies was a great thing. I just wanted to make sure that the people of Barbados and the people in the West Indies were able to be there, you know, like if they actually saw the game. Because the West Indies in England, you know, they did so much for the West Indies team because they were always there. There was a time when the West Indians were able to, you know, during the, the laws and indeed the one day, Old Trafford, not Old Trafford, um, what's the other one, Sobby? And the Oval. Yeah, you've been in England, that's all right. Yeah, and I'm telling you that West Indian support was one of the greatest things that we as players could, could do. So, this thing that we have here that I actually, you know, decided that I, I would do, I wish to say to you that as far as I'm concerned, we were able to do quite a few things. For instance, when I came back to Barbados after playing all over the world for 12 years, when we came back, the first thing that happened to me, I came back because Cable Awareness offered me a job. And I wish to say that when I left school at 17, I went to for Cable Awareness for the first time. I wish to tell you that that is the only time in my life that I had to, you know, apply for a job. So that for the balance of my life, the jobs that I did were what people wanted me to do. Yes, I came back here to work with Cape Manoeles as a staff welfare officer throughout the Caribbean. And that was again traveling. Gary, again, I apologize for that because anytime a man plays, um, you know, if he, he plays 12 years, touring all over the world, and then takes a, immediately takes a, a, a job that was taking him away from his children. And secondly, the, 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 um, I was asked by the Governor General, two weeks after I came back to Barbados, to serve in the Senate as an independent senator. 
And I am saying that any time a man do those three things, well, he, he needs to have a checkup from the neck up. So Kerry, I would apologize for me not being there all the time. The other things that were done, the things that we, we had to do, Mr. Barrow called me and asked me, and asked me to, to, you know, come into the Democratic Labour Party, and um, he actually offered me a position on the team. I refused it because it was eight minutes. It was only about six weeks to go. I was going to run against a formidable foe in Vic Johnson. And I didn't think it was the right thing. But Bramford Tate, the, 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 what do you call the, the people who have died? Um, he, yes, the late. What a simple word. I don't even know it. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, he said the late, the late Bramford Tate said, Wes, I will help you. And I decided to run. All right? Now, Apart from politics, you would know from reading the papers that cricket, politics, and religion have been a vinculum of my life. It really was. I played in Australia and all over the world, and I came home and then found that I was into something that is politics, that is a very serious thing. And I want to say to you that as far as I'm concerned, politics and, um, politics and you know, doing the things like helping people. Now that was my position. I wanted to really help the people. And I felt that when I was in the Senate as a Governor General Senator, I felt that I couldn't help anybody. So going into the field, and, you know, going in among the people, living in the constituency that I had, that was a good thing for me. So therefore, I wish to say to you that politics has been good to me, but I want to say to you that every time that I felt that I'd done something that was worthy of emulation, believe you me, within five weeks, Something will happen to, you know, to, to mess it up. <laughs> they won't remember me for, more too, for too long. Let me give you some examples. I played for the West Indies and went to India. And the second, the very second match, okay, the second match, I got, I, I got, oh, she said I have to wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, but just, just let me say this. Just let me say this. This is important. This is important. Because Frank Wuerl, Frank Wuerl said that I was, Frank Wuerl said that I was, you know, a, a, a man who rules the, 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 the not, not the, on the field, I ruled the dressing room. Now, the reason why that was so is that every time I did something well, Something will get it. Take, for instance, Charlie Gulf and I bowled a whole day. I do admit he had three, de three days, three, three, um, he had three overs less. But I bowled from six, um, it was from nine o'clock in the morning to about 6.50 in the evening. And I thought that was my greatest performance. I thought it was greater than the tightest. And do you know that when I did that, a, an Englishman a writer, he said that Frank, he said that our captain, he said our captain has let go the dogs on him. That hurt me very much. You know, then another woman, she, yeah, the other lady said, another lady said that you ugly baboon, why don't you go back to Barbados in the next year? Now, I, I, I'm not really a handsome man, but I ain't too bad. You know what I mean? So, that, that, so I just wish to, um, I just wish to tell you these things. 
I would like to thank all of you for coming. I would like to say to you that this means a lot to me. It is not my terrain, you know, b b bowling for five minutes, but, you know, I, <laughs> I, I will forgive you. And um, I would say that it has been really a thrill to me to go in this exercise. Paul is a giant as a fellow. He is, you will hear something about him. In fact, this, this, this book, thousands of people in, in England will soon be asking him to do something for them. I would also like to Mr. Mr. McKenzie. This man is one of the greatest booksellers in the world, at least in England, and particularly he is doing um, a great deal there. I am so happy to have sort of met both of them. And so we have been able to do this book. Um, Kerry, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go now. <laughs> okay. But just let me, let me, just let me say this. Yeah, right. Yeah, right, Daddy. <laughs> yes, sir. Just let me say this. I love every one of you here. There's no doubt about it. You know, I know that politics is a thing that, you know, but let me just say this one thing. I am the, I, I am the only, I am the only West Indian player that went into the cabinet. That is a fact. You should, you should clap for that. You know? It is true. And I found out why. Because if you are not for one side and you stay neutral, both sides will love you. So that's what happened to all my friends. What happened to me is that the, the other side, I was in trouble all the time. So thank you very much for having me, and we'll see you sometime. Sir Wes Hall, the one and only. The Prime Minister of Barbados is a speaker much in demand everywhere on the planet. In fact, she has another engagement this evening, so we're fortunate to have her here to give the keynote address. Please welcome Prime Minister Motley. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Right Excellent Sir Gary Sovers, National Hero of Barbados, and Jackie, his partner. Distinguished Knights of the Realm, distinguished guests, but above all else, one of my favorite people, Sir Wesley Hall. I am here this evening because in answering the call to Sir Wesley's call, it was important for me to be here to signal not just to you, Sir Wes, but to the entire country, as I indicated when we unveiled your statue, our tremendous pride and honor that we hold you in as a Barbadian who has literally accomplished so much across so many different spheres. I can tell you without going further that you don't need to wonder whether you were handsome or not <laughs> because I have heard too many women reflect positively <laughs> including myself <laughs> on both your facial as well as your stature your facial attributes and stature but perhaps where I need to start is to explain why I'm here this evening 
even though in a few minutes I go to deal with St. Michael Speaks. As a young girl, I had the opportunity to serve in the Senate, not as an independent senator, but as an opposition senator. And in that period of time, which really became tumultuous between 1991 and 94, I would go into the House of Assembly on many occasions. Sir Philip, you were there. Sir Richard, you were there. Many others were there. But there is that one night that shall forever be etched in my own memory when so as you and others, a few others, spoke from a position of conscience and placed country before party. And that has been the example of Because as I look behind me, or as I look in front of me, there are those who, like you, would be born into circumstances that some may consider unfortunate, but clearly born into circumstances if they were lucky, like you, to have material poverty matched by spiritual and character building richness. And that is a message that many of our people need to reflect on today. The ability to be faithful to a few principles, honesty, integrity, Empathy, discipline, courage. These things don't belong to people who have material prosperity. These things belong to each and every human being who chooses to walk the walk and not simply talk the talk. And I look forward to reading this book because I'm sure that there are many, many, many more examples of that with which I'm already familiar. You know, you said just before you sat that part of the difficulty of being that one cricketer who became a cabinet member was that you had to choose a side and those who did not choose sides were loved by both. I don't normally contradict you, but I have to do so this evening. Because I can count across the decades people on both sides of the partisan political fence who continue not only to like you but to have had tremendous respect for you because of the manner in which you comported yourself and engaged with others. And that is the second lesson that perhaps those of us who are in public life today or who want to come to public life should forever recall. And it isn't only you, in fairness, I look at Sir Philip, who equally distinguished himself in that way. And I look at Sir Richard, who equally distinguished himself in that way. And those of you who are in this audience, many of whom are very political on both sides, will echo what I am saying because there was and must always be a class of Barbadian politician who knows what it is to be able to be respected and accepted by all if we are to preserve the integrity of the public space 
on this 166 square miles. And the last point that I'd like to make is this. The example of you committing your life to the ultimate bosses you would say, to our Lord and Savior, is one that perhaps ought to cause many to reflect yet again. There's a very unfortunate tendency, particularly by younger persons, to believe that spirituality does not matter and religion does not matter. And regrettably, we have seen too many people not exposed at an early age to the anchoring and rooting that is necessary to maintain a strong moral compass and a strong sense of spirituality at the very least and religion at best. Bishop, I heard your very long prayer this evening. It was short in comparison to what might otherwise be associated with Sir Wesley. <laughs> but the point that I'm making is this, that we have to have some conversations with our families. I'm not even talking now at the national level, but I'm speaking at the level of families in communities, extended families. The African proverb says it takes a village to raise a child. Well, I'm talking about the village that raised our children traditionally. Gabby, you are familiar with that concept. And I believe that the ability to anchor our people with that strong sense of spirituality or religion, depending on which framework you want to pursue, is absolutely critical at this time in our world where there is so much happening that if you are not anchored and deeply anchored, you can literally fall off of the precipice. I believe that your work, so as in this area, knew no limits. And it was fair to say that your approach to religion and spirituality allowed you to be a roving minister, not in any way contained by any one sect or religious grouping, but recognizing that in each and every human being, you saw the image and the work of God. And that that has been what has propelled you at every stage of your life to be able to be of service to your fellow brethren and sisters. I am not here to speak long or to score a century today. But I am here to say to you and to your family, all of whom I have known for my entire life, that you need not worry about whether you spent enough time or didn't. You know, the old people would tell us that pear don't fall from an apple tree. And the example that your children have given us is an example of the love and the nurturing which you gave them. I like to tell my own parents that 90% of who we are at the end of the day comes from who and how we were raised and forged. And when I heard you just now reflect on whether you spent sufficient time with Kerry and Sean, in particular who I know better, I say to you that you need not worry. And that you, perhaps more than any of us in this room, 
are entitled this evening to feel blessed, loved, and honored. And those blessings and that love and that honor comes not simply from those of us present, but I think I know enough about Barbados to know that it is also reflected in the hearts of the majority of the people of this country. <laughs> to Mr. Ackroyd, the task of writing a book is not easy. And that you should have persevered during the world's most challenging time in the last century, that of the pandemic, speaks not just simply to your ability, but to your commitment and character first and foremost. Because the easiest thing would have been to say that I have other things to do or other things concern me. And to you too, Mr. McKenzie, because in today's world, the ability to hold a physical book is not valued in the same way that it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. And therefore, by extension, the economics of publishing have changed significantly over the course of the last few decades. I very much su su suspect, therefore, that this book is as much about your passion as it is about the potential for a return. And it is therefore against that backdrop that I say to you on behalf of Barbados and Barbadians, thank you for your interest, thank you for your commitment, both of you, and thank you for allowing us to capture another aspect of our sociocultural history in a way that will hopefully inspire many of our young people to be able to know that once they are committed and reflective of the character to which I spoke and given opportunity that they too can achieve anything and everything in this world, not just in this country. So my friends, thank you very much for affording me the opportunity on behalf of the government and people of Barbados, Suez, to be able to be associated yet again with stories of not just character, but of excellence and of global impact. There are people who still will call your name from the outer reaches of the globe and who remember the exploits of yourself and Sagarfield and 3Ws and everyone else that this small rock has produced. My good friend next to you, Sir Charles, will remember these exploits, not just of people who were cricketers, but of men who came from perhaps the smallest rock that they could come from to capture the imagination of an entire planet. To Barbadians now and the future generations, I say, we have an example of what it is to be a global player and to have global impact and to attain excellence. Long may that example be celebrated by generations of Barbadians because as we all know, Size has never defined us, and what we can achieve is constrained only by what is humanly possible for an individual so to achieve. God bless you all, and God bless the family of Wells Hall for supporting him during the course of this journey. Thank you very much. Prime Minister, we are indebted to you for your remarks. And before you leave, uh, Sir Wes has a presentation to make to you.
Ah, <laughs> Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, there is also to be a presentation to two institutions very influential in Sir Wes's life, as he mentioned in his presentation, the St. Giles Primary School and the Combermere School. So if representatives of those two institutions are here, can you come forward at this time so that you may receive your copies of the book? I see a Combermere tie. St. Giles. Tell them to come up. Will the representative from St. Giles Primary please come forward if you are present? St. Giles, they're saying, okay. Ah, I see, okay. Just taking a photograph with the PM. I'm told. Well, while we wait, you might have realized from your program that we had to make a slight adjustment in order to accommodate the PM schedule. We've heard a lot about the book and the subject of the biography. And in a few moments, we're going to hear an excerpt from the book answering the call. And it will be read by Ms. Cora Cumberbatch who, as Mr. Ackroyd explained, played a significant role in bringing the manuscript to publication. Well, perhaps we can do that now, have that reading now, and when the St. Giles representative is in the Ah, here she comes, here she comes. Oh, two of them, okay. Here you are, of oh, this way. Oh, 
I'm sure this is a moment that they both will remember for many years to come. Giving back to his alma mater. Thank you so much. Well, at this stage, we're going to invite Mrs. Cora Cumberbatch to come forward and read an excerpt from Answering the Call. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tonight I'm reading an extract from chapter 26, Cricket, Citizenship and Independence, Suez's Choice. It was the best of times for West Indies cricket. I'm not reading the book yet. It was a time when the teacher CLR James wrote a lesson in his book Beyond the Boundary. That lesson changed the history of cricket and Caribbean leaders. It was a lesson that coaxed Caribbean leaders into cutting the umbilical cord of colonialism. In 2012, Suez was invited to speak at the Trinidad and Tobago Cricket Board's 50th Anniversary of Independence Award Ceremony. I am reading part of that speech. Page 272. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that in my playing years, the West Indies cricket team was the only multiracial outfit in the international arena? Do you realize that we were a rainbow coalition in a world that had not yet begun to understand the beauty of ethnic diversity? Do you realize that the cricket team was a mirror in which we saw what the independent nation should look like? The philosophy which celebrates the principle one for all and all for one was what we tried to normalize. It was the idealism to which I was committed. Let me conclude on this note. When we talk of West Indian cricket as a development tool for our people, we are speaking of the importance of cricket to something much bigger than itself, the nation their collective consciousness, our identity, and the culture we have crafted out of our harsh history. All of this became clear to me shortly after the facts surrounding the 1960 Tide Test were made known. I knew the importance that Frank Worrell had attached to that tour. I knew that the Federation was in difficulty. What I did not know at the time was that CLR James had written to Frank to let him know that if he and the boys showed that West Indies was ready to manage its own affairs, it would signal the end of colonialism. What a prophecy. Worrell, Constantine, and CLR James understood those things. They represented the link between cricket, independence, and citizenship. They were enormous, yet cricket was bigger. Can you imagine that we were just playing in a cricket series and the future of the region was tied up in the outcome? and the five million West Indians understood 
that independence needed a grand psychological advantage and cricket was expected to provide it, the indomitable spirit of the West Indian people as they supported the West Indies team caused a wave of nationalism which made independence easier for the citizenship to accept. To this day, with over 50 years of close contact with West Indies cricket, I do not believe that I know half of what there is to know. The literature that our scholars produced from CLR James, Prime Minister Michael Manley, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, and Tony Cozier is the richest literature in the world. And all of it speaks to the magnificence of being a West Indian in a world that gave us so little, but in which we created so much. As we look to the future, I maintain that the relationship between cricket and the national consciousness will evolve, but will stand firm in spite of talk about the fading of the West Indian cricket culture and the competition from other sporting activities. End of the extract. Excellency Sir Gary, all the knights in the room, and all of you, honored guests, thank you for your attention. Madam MC. Thank you, Mrs. Kamabat, for such a beautiful reading of that excerpt. And we have another orator who will be coming to share more excerpts from the text answering the call, Sir Henry Fraser. Madam MC, conductor of this evening's orchestra, national hero, Sir Gary, my own wonderful and dear hero, Sir Wes, my wonderful and dear friend, Dr. Kerry Hall, Sir Philip, and everyone else, family and friends of Sir Wes. As public orator, I had the pleasure of presenting Sir Wes back in 2005 when the University of the West Indies at Cave Hill conferred on him an honorary doctorate of laws. I enjoyed that tremendously. It was a great pleasure and a great honor and this is how I began my citation. Chancellor, when we were growing up as boys, it was the dream of every schoolboy to be a West Indian cricket hero and to drive an MG sports car. Before you this evening, Chancellor, is a man who not only became a West Indian cricket hero, but also acquired not one, but two MGs a minister of government, and a minister of God. Now, I have to tell you that as I was asked to choose and read some excerpts from this wonderful book, I started marking passages that I really liked and might consider reading. Well, here's my copy, and you can see all of these purple markers, dozens of them, because there was just so much that I thought I would love to share. Well, I had to cut from dozens to a dozen and then cut again. And so here are just a few of the choices of the choice. Page 26. Wes's debut for Comba Mare's first 11. His mother sensed his anxiety and her voice was gentle and calming. I have something for you, Wesley. 
She handed him a small package, and opening it, Wes set eyes for the first time on the cross and chain that would mean so much to him. She had given the few pieces of jewellery she owned to her cousin, Klesbert McLean, a jeweller, and asked him to melt them down and make the crucifix. She placed it around her son's neck. Wes was so overcome with emotion that he was unable even to thank her. Sensing his discomfort, she held him in her arms and assured him that despite his nerves, all he could do was to give his best, and the chain and the crucifix would remind him to allow God to be at the center of everything he did in his life. Determined not to let his mum see him cry, Wes picked up his kit and ran down the road as fast as he could to the bus stop with tears streaming down his cheeks. And at that moment, he recognized the special qualities in his mother and he vowed always to listen to her wisdom. His mother's blessing stayed with him forever. He had a scare in Adelaide when the chain came unhooked and feeling that it was lost, he was in a complete panic. And he remains eternally grateful to Crawford White of the Daily Express in London, who stayed to search with him and found it by the Adelaide Oval, by the gates. As Wes would say, God is good. The next passage is Wes answering the call, the first of his major calls, the first critical call for his career. Wes took his place in the cable and wireless team as wicketkeeper. A few weeks into the season, the captain, Sonny Jilks, asked him to remove his pads and bowl a few overs to take the shine off the new ball, as he told you. Wes pro protested that he had never bowled a ball in a match before, not even at Combermere, sorry, Combermere, and he had no interest in ever bowling, but he dutifully answered the call and he took seven Wanderers wickets for 25 runs. Tom Graveney. He condemned Wes to a punishing first-class debut. Wes recalls his astonishment when Graveney went onto the front foot and sent a short of a length delivery crashing against the scoreboard. Never in his brief career had a batsman advanced down the wicket to attack a short ball and it left him visibly crestfallen. The gracious Graveney walked down the wicket to Wes and said, listen, son, he would have looked up to Wes, listen, son, you've got loads of talent. The thing is, I'm on the go, so just don't worry about it. A few years later, he hit Graveney in a hostile spell at Lord's, and as the batsman picked himself up off the ground, Wes walked up and said, Oh, Tom, don't worry about it. You're full of talent. You're a great player. But I am on the go. <laughs> you remember that, said Graveney? Every word, said Wes. A bit more humor. While playing and coaching in Australia, he and Sir Gary were in Brisbane for a match. And they went to the races because races were Wes's Second passion. Well, they went to the races in Wes's company car, a green Aussie Holden, which they left in the car park. After winning with his first three bets, they walked back to the car park early when Wes realized that 50% of the cars in the car park were Holden, and a lot of them were green. Well, the attendant watched carefully and suspiciously as the two men moved from car to car trying the locks and Wes thought it was just a matter of time before he would call the police. So they gave up. By six o'clock they returned and there were just two cars left, both green Holdens. So Wes waited for the owner of the other one to leave and he says, to the puzzlement of the attendant, I just opened my car with the key and we were gone. Looking beyond the statistics. Our reward, says Wes, was not commensurate with our effort. But I would have played for nothing. I was very happy. People may be interested in your stats, 
but they care about how you made them feel. That's what they remember. People have said they've seen me taking off from the sight screen at Sabina Park, and they felt the excitement. But that's Sir Wes. His motto, like mine, is to love is to serve. More humor. In the fourth test of 1962 against India in Port of Spain here, Wes went in last with the score at 346 for nine with Sir Frank. Whirl wanted more runs and he instructed Wes to hold on and bat sensibly. Wes answered the call. He did as he was told. But with his score in the 20s, he played three serious cover drives. Whirl came down the wicket to Wes with a smile. Winfield, are you trying to make me look bad? No, sir. I'm just trying to make you aware that there are four W's. Whirl, Weeks, Walcott, and Wes. <laughs> of Sir Gary. He has said so much about Sir Gary, I could only summarize it in these two wonderful sentences. I don't think there is anybody in the world who understands cricket like Sobers. I believe he has the greatest cricket brain ever, and Sobers is a genius, Sir Wes. But was Wes an angel or a devil? In 2000, he was invited to preach at the St. Martin in the Fields Church in Trafalgar Square in London. The occasion was a service to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the first West Indies tour to England. He shared the duties of priesthood with the Bishop of Liverpool, Lord David Shepherd, former England Test cricketer who left cricket for God. They had met on the cricket field just once in the MCC's tour match against Queensland in November 62 when Wes was there and Shepherd had enjoyed the better fortunes, the much better fortunes on that occasion. He opened the batting against Wes and he scored 94. Nevertheless, Shepherd's sermon reflected the feelings of the many batsmen who had experienced Wes bearing down on them from 22 yards. And he said, I just wish to tell you, I am so pleased to see Wes here today. As I see him in his cassock and surplice and collar, I want to say he looks like an angel. But don't be fooled. With a cricket ball in his hand, he's a devil. As inspiring as an inspiring, popular, ever popular priest. Wes has been in great demand since he answered the call of God. His sermon at our mutual friend Tony Cozier's funeral brought tears to my eyes. So Tono, as you repose in your mahogany silence, what a wonderful metaphor. Let the record show that we love you and will never forget you. O oh, warrior of words, you have written your name on history's page. So go to the plan that God has for you, a plan greater than the best minds can conceive and richer than human language can explore. May you rest in peace and rise in glory. And on his gentle nature, Hanif Mohammed said, he was a very gentle and generous cricketer, the reason why he was extremely popular with crowds. And Charlie Griffith, Sir Charles, a man who knew him better than any other player, considers Wes the kindest, most likable fast bowler the, that has ever been. He wouldn't harm a fly. 
And finally, the words of the griots, C.L.R. James, who taught us that cricket in the West Indies is an art and must be compared with other arts. Lord Constantine and Sir Frank opine that our cricket is a metaphor that mirrors cultural, political, and social change. A regional integrator, a unifying force, says Sir Wes. Ladies and gentlemen, these are just a few pearls from a rare treasure chest that we are really blessed to share. Answering the call is inspired like the entire life of Sir Wes. It's been a brilliant partnership between Sir Wes and Paul Croyd and Mr. Mackenzie, typical of Sir Wes, and the best book I've read for a long time, and I read a lot. Thank you a thousand times, Sir Wes and Paul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Sir Henry. We've come to the final item on this evening's program, the vote of thanks. Please join us for cocktail reception immediately after the vote of thanks. And there are copies of Answering the Call available for sale at the back of the room. If you're not prepared to get your copy this evening, the book will also be available at Cricket Legends of Barbados and local bookstores. It's also available through online platforms like Amazon. And now Mr. Calvin Hope has the task of saying thank you. Mr. Hope, where are you? Here he comes. You have the final word. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. All protocols have been established. So I will go straight into the vote of thanks. We would like, on behalf of Wes and his organizing committee, to thank Bishop Lionel Clark for his words and prayers this evening. Special thanks to the Prime Minister of Barbados for her address to us and interesting words about Wes. Thank Dr. Credit Kerry Hall for her reflections on the book. Thank Cora Cumberbatch for her reading her excerpts. We thank Sir Henry Frazier for his comments and reading excerpts from the book. This evening will not have been possible without support from some sponsors, and I name them now. Um, the management and staff of Kensington Noble um, Management Company, referred to as Comey. Special mention must be made of the chairman of Comey, Damien Gaskin, and Diane Prescott. Also, thank you to the president and board of the Barbados Cricket Association for their contribution, and also to um, Carl Roberts Reefer and the NCF for their contribution also. Mr. Peter Harris of Consumer Guarantee Insurance and Bayview Hospital and also to Mr. Wallace Griffith of ShopSmart um, for his contribution, kind contribution. And Mr. Thani of the Royal Shop for his contribution also. And to Chef Edie of Car Caribbean Cuisine for providing the refreshments this evening. To also thank you, Sir Wes, for giving us the reason for this wonderful night and by living the extraordinary life you did. But last but not least, I must also mention Julia Kane 
and Mali Marshall of Cricket Legends of Barbados who have helped us tremendously in organizing this event. To the organizing committee, ably led by Roxanne Branca, who worked very hard in leading us, Cora Cumberbatch, Dr. Kerry Hall, thank you very much for, on behalf of Wes, for the meetings and um, your creativity to all the technical people that have supported this event and caused it to be streamed live um, to over 10,000 people. And to you all that came here tonight, we all thank you very much for attending. Thank you.